Hey everyone, welcome back. I spoke with Gene Bose today, the CEO of the Northwest Center in Seattle. And oftentimes our guests will challenge my thinking and just give me whole new ways of looking at things. And I think Gene will do that for you today as well. He talks about belonging and inclusion and abilities and disabilities in ways that I think are different and helpful and productive and challenging. He's a guy who spent years as a consultant with Deloitte and, and Microsoft. He actually spent nine years flying for the U.S. Navy. And you can feel the love and energy and hope and spirit that he brings to the work because he cares deeply about it. His wife and he have two adult children. One of them has disabilities. And he talks about that and how it shaped his path in life. He shares tremendous stories. One of them has to do with a deaf employee at Amazon and how that employee was not only included, but ended up improving the entire work environment for all the employees. His book recommendation at the end of our chat was unexpected, at least it was by me, but I think you'll find it interesting and useful. So thanks for joining us today. Hey, Gene, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. It's great to see you. Good morning, Tom. Thanks for having me. Great to be Absolutely. here. Absolutely. And it is morning. You're in uh, Washington, the state of Washington, about three hours earlier than me. So thanks for getting up early and, and starting your day, starting your week with me. Um, and I want to I jump right in because I know what you do matters to you a lot. And you said something a few weeks ago to me that really I still can't... Um, get out of my head in a, in a good way. Um, but it was, you know, what, what if rather than seeing a person's disabilities, we focused on the abilities that they do have. And so I'd love to just get your thoughts on what, what does that mean to you? Yeah, for me, the, so at Northwest Center, our, our tagline is people of all abilities. And it's, we serve people with disabilities, but uh, as an organization, we really try to focus on that. And for me, more of the answer is, uh, as I look back through my life, it's really woven into my whole life, not just my time at Northwest Center. So growing up in a big family uh, in the Midwest, um, the focus in our household was always about uh, one, respect and boundaries and, 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 and to uh, allow people to be themselves. So it's this new term that you hear a lot about, about belonging. Um, belonging is not about fitting in. Belonging is actually about being able to be yourself, your true self. And and engage in the world that way. Uh, it's similar to that. It's that we all have our we all have our gifts. You know, we all have our shortcomings. But we all have our gifts as well. And so, why would we think about people with disabilities in any other way? Yes, there's a this part where there's some challenges that they have to work through. Certainly, that someone like me that I don't have a disability uh, that I have the blessing to not have to work through. But quite frankly, they have gifts and talents that that I don't have, and perspective that I don't have. So I think looking through the world through that lens. So if you can look around you and look for ability as opposed to disability or look for the bad, you know, the bad things. And I, and I think this goes not just for people with disabilities, but if you look at, for example, in the workplace, if you try to look around you and understand the gifts and the talents that your fellow workers have, I think that makes you a better employee as well, because you're going to know when to leverage those gifts and talents from someone else that may fill in a gap that you have. Mm. And why, why is this so important to you, Gene? Why is this, um, this mindset or this way of being and sort of your contribution to the world? Why are you, why are you putting your, your time and energy into this now? Well, I'm smiling because there's two things. There's, and uh, there's some humor in the second one I'll, I'll share. That's, it's more self-revealing than anything. Um, but, but I'd start with uh, my father had MS. He had a disability. Um, I had a cousin with a disability. I have a 28-year-old daughter with a disability, she's on the severe end of the autism spectrum. So throughout my life, I've been able to experience the world removed once from the disability, but I see how the world disengages or does not allow people to engage. And quite frankly, if you go back to the, my earlier comments, it's like, we, we won't reach our potential until we allow everyone to engage and contribute. So until I'm able to let everyone engage and share their abilities, share their talents and their gifts, I won't become 
the person that, that I can potentially become. And so it's really important me, to me from that perspective, because I do think we're all better together. Yeah, that may not be a popular stance in today's world, um, as polar as we see so many different topics across the country, but honestly, I do believe we're better together. Um, the other part, going back to a comment about being able to leverage your, um, your fellow employees' gifts that might fill in a gap that you might have. You know, I think of it that way. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and there's this very uh, resounding theme of guilt about not being enough or, or not being good enough. And so that's how I fill up that gap. I don't worry about not being good enough because I've let other people into my life and I know they're gonna fill in the gaps that I have. So you, you, you get to 100% by addition, you have multiple people. None of us are 100% of anything that anyone needs, but if we're willing to let others engage and join us, uh, we can really quickly get to 100%. Hmm. The, the, the world, you know, the world disengages. I think back to my grade school experience going to a public school just outside of Detroit, Michigan area. And there was that classroom, you know, the, that classroom that frankly, now that I reflect on as an adult was uh, the classroom that we avoided. I didn't like to go to that end of the hallway, um, which as a little kid seemed like a mile away, but it was probably 30 feet away, you know, from my classroom. And it was that classroom where the kids with the disabilities were. It was, it was segmented. It was separate from, if we saw them, you know, once every six months, um, that was a lot. And you know, I, I know that was the system sort of that I grew up in. But I, I think back on even my mindset as a kid and sort of seeing those kids as the others, you know, um, and and that's why I think you're. Your point about seeing people's abilities really hit me to my core because it shook sort of all the way back to my my childhood. Um, and I know we've come a long way in the last 30 or 40 years in, in that regard, um, but it still, it still just bothers me. You know, I don't know how else to put it other than it, it bothers me that, that we even um, even had that, you know, not too long ago. And so as you look at the world today and you look at how the the world is treating people with with disabilities. What gives you um, a sense of optimism for the future? So thinking, uh, well, a lot of things do give me optimism. I think uh, as people experience what inclusion can look like, I think that that gives me optimism. So let, let me just stay in the employment arena, uh, for example. So um, for, for Northwest Center, we, we do focus cradle through career. And there's, you know, there's, there's examples I think I can give across that entire spectrum of life, but let me stick in the employment uh, place most of all. I think with inclusion, uh, first it's important to, to, to make, make clear, we, we look at inclusion all up. So yes, we're serving a disability community. Um, and I use the words, we're serving a disability community only to get people to understand that it's people with disabilities that we're focused on. But quite frankly, we're not serving the disability community, we're serving society because the benefit is to society. It's not to the people with disabilities. You know, they're not broken. They're fully realized human beings. What they need is opportunity. So when you look in the employment arena for inclusion, we're, we're looking at inclusion as human beings, because I think if you, if you try anything short of that, you're gonna fall, you're not gonna succeed. So for us, if, if we're not focused on inclusion as human beings, we're not gonna open as many doors as we need to, uh, to the disability community, for example. But I think what scares people is the unknown. So how do I become inclusive? Well, first, why is it important to me? And then if I'm going to be inclusive, wow, that's going to be really hard. Uh, and the truth is, it's not really hard. It's, it's difficult. It takes energy, it takes intention, but it's not this overwhelming uh, investment that you have to make to become more inclusive. So if I describe uh, one of our commercial businesses, so we have six different commercial businesses as part of our, our, our business portfolio at Northwest Center. One of them is a commercial laundry. And if you go into that commercial laundry, you're going to see a workforce of roughly 60 people, uh, 17 different languages, 15 different national origins, different skin color, different sexual orientation, different intellectual ability. Uh, it's, this, it's this melting pot. But what you see is a unified workforce. And so what gives me optimism is when we can talk about inclusion, but then we walk someone through a tour of what it really looks like in the workplace, the way their faces light up and the way the dots connect and the way they realize, wow, 
uh, this is possible. This looks like what I want at my place of employment or, or uh, as a leader of, of an employer, this is what I want my culture to look like. Uh, that's really optimistic. So I think we, have a, we, we do have a great message. I think as people experience it, that's what gives me optimism because uh, to a person, for example, that would go through a tour, they would walk away viscerally impacted by what they saw. No matter what they heard before the tour, seeing it, it, it really makes a big difference. So that, that's what gives me optimism is that if we can engage people just to have the conversation, then being able to have the conversation, I think, uh, yields great results. So that's, that's what I'm most optimistic about is people. You know, that I think we're all willing to listen. If we can get ourselves to stop and slow down and listen, um, that's what gives me hope is that people do listen. This isn't a, for example, uh, this isn't a, a, um, a left side of the aisle or right side of the aisle conversation. This is a human conversation that, that everyone can step in and engage in. And it, and it starts with the fundamental belief that they, they aren't broken, you know, that society benefits from their participation. This isn't about doing a nice thing um, for folks with disabilities. It's actually about how does the society benefit when we are more inclusive because they have so much to offer. Right, right. The trick is, uh, for me anyway, I think about how we're wide as human beings. Every decision we make is about what's in it for me. Uh, and that's, uh, there isn't anything wrong with that. That's how we're wired. So part of it is owning that is in the audience, what's in it for them? And I think there's an awful lot in the inclusion space for all of us. There's value for us, not just value for the people with disabilities. So just getting, getting people to think of it from a different perspective uh, really helps them engage. As you, as you, you know, in this day and age, inclusion even of itself is a, uh, can be a polarizing topic, kind of interesting, right? Um, the whole idea of inclusion is to include other people's perspectives. You don't have to agree with them, but just to be able to include a different perspective, I think is so difficult for our human minds to, to process in this polarized day and age. Um, so how would you um, suggest that, that fellow CEOs out there, you've got over a thousand employees um, all around Seattle area. You know, you've got an impressive background. You worked for Microsoft, I think for a while and Deloitte Consulting and a few other consulting firms. You were in the Navy for, for nine years, if I remember correctly. Um, what, given that impressive background, what, what advice would you give to leaders out there who are struggling with this whole idea of inclusion and what to even do with it in this day and age? Uh, I think that I'd start off with something that I'd said before. You need to be intentional about it. Um, it's, it is, it's work. It's, it's, it's not easy. If it was easy, we'd already all be doing it, right? So I think make the commitment uh, to inclusion in a way that you can understand, you know, what's in it for you as an individual, what's in it for your company? Uh, because you go back to, to the kind of the, the company dynamic and the why of a company, not the what of a company, but the why of a company. Understand why it's important for your company and for your employees. And I think that's the, the very first step, but then recognize that um, you're not gonna make everyone happy in all this. And what I mean by that is not everyone's going to embrace inclusion in the same way. And some people will certainly still be dip, um, um, dismissive of it or resistant to it. Uh, to join in it. So know that you're not going to make everyone happy, but understand that everyone does come out ahead and, and just recognize that the change curve, you know, people are going to jump on the change curve at different points. So I think being committed to it and understanding why it's important to your organization is the first step. And I do truly believe there's a business case for it. You know, that's probably a whole nother podcast. Uh, there's a business case for doing it and, and why it's important, but then, um, Again, settle in and recognize it's going to be a hard journey. It's a long journey. That's not just a, a couple workshops or a PowerPoint and you're good to go. It's, it's a generational change that we're trying to drive. So be ready for a, a journey in all this. And then lastly, I would say is be open um, to partners in this. So be open to partners like a Northwest Center. So don't try to go it alone. Um, again, it's not to say you won't be successful if you go it alone, but reach out to the community around you. There are a lot of different organizations and people that know a lot about inclusion, um, people that are living in a world that's not engaging them, that can help you think through 
the things that you're going to need to do to, to make sure you get the most out of that inclusion journey. Yeah, there's and there is plenty of business case and that probably is a whole separate podcast, you know, but Harvard and McKinsey, two pretty reputable sources have studied this and found the the improvement in uh, innovation revenues around, you know, being more inclusive and being more diverse and not just racially, but but in all areas. And I think that's one of the interesting things that you're putting on the table for us is that, you know, being more inclusive of folks with with quote unquote disabilities is actually not just a benefit for them, it's a benefit for the organization. And so you you gave the example of the the laundry, but I'm curious, what other what other examples can you give to our listeners to really drive home this point that the that society is missing out? So the if you if you take uh, I'm not going to be able to do this complete justice, but one of our partnerships, um, bigger partnerships, is with Amazon, and we partner with them as a vendor because we provide vendor services to them, and we also partner them uh, with them from an employment services perspective and placing people of all abilities within Amazon. Uh, and then just going to this uh, really common theme today about talent acquisition and finding employees, uh, that, this the idea of attrition and, and absenteeism and how important those things are uh, to, to the challenges that we face, but finding employees and keeping employees is really important. But in one of the facilities where we placed uh, people of all abilities, we had a candidate that was deaf and the leadership at the facility um, their major concerns were well we don't believe this individual could be successful here safe safely because we have forklifts we have all kinds of machinery going around and if they can't hear you know they're not they're not going to be able to operate it safely in this environment so we don't want to consider that candidate so i use this example because they're looking at the dis not the ability and so we said well we understand the safety concerns. Those are valid concerns. Again, this isn't easy. It's uh, if, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, but let's just take a minute, think through this and see if there's an accommodation we might be able to come up with that will eliminate that safety issue for that individual. And so we spent a very little time because the employment services team and Northwest Center are pretty amazing people. They said, well, we believe this individual that's, that's deaf can operate safely if we put the circular mirrors up across the warehouse. And that they'll be able to see anything that's coming. You know, that's that's something that uh, they're very in tune to the world visually to make make up for the deficit of um, being having hearing loss. So we think this would be something worth trying because we think this in, individual is, is uh, extraordinarily gifted, and it would be unfortunate if we didn't take advantage of of their talent in the space. And so they they accommodated that thought process, and so we put the circular mirrors up in the warehouse, place that individual, uh, that individual is thriving uh, in that environment. So no safety issues whatsoever, but the byproduct of that thought process and that accommodation for that one individual actually raised the safety record of the entire warehouse. Because oh, wow. all of us see just because we don't, we, we can hear, doesn't mean we can't look in a mirror, right? So this accommodation while intended to place one individual, allowed the whole workforce to be even, even more safe. So I think uh, I, I use that as an illustration because yes, it's hard, you have to be intentional, but everyone benefits from the thought process and the pieces that you put in place. Uh, that's such an awesome, awesome story. Um, so if, if organizations out there want to be more inclusive specifically of, of folks that, that have all abilities, as you said, of folks with, with disabilities of different kinds, where would where should they start? Where should they think about starting this this uh, journey? So great question. I think the first place they need to look is in their HR and talent acquisition teams, because what it requires you to do is to to change the way you think about talent acquisition. So it's not just going and grabbing a resume on Indeed.com and going through the, the machine language words, finding the, the keywords, and then getting an individual and then doing a you know, a, a phone interview or a conference room interview. I think really think about uh, one, how are you gonna go find the ability that you wanna find for that role, but then challenge your traditional recruiting uh, venues and your recruiting channels because you're, you're missing out on talent that doesn't believe they actually have an opportunity with your organization. So just quickly 
in general, what I've seen, uh, people with disabilities uh, don't fully believe that they're employable in some cases. So they have this great ability, but they don't have this belief that there's an employer out there willing to take a chance on them uh, and employ them. So think about your recruiting pipelines and how you tap into the market in a better way uh, that draws in candidates for you. But then the second piece of this is, is always focus on ability and need. And what I mean by that is the reason we're successful is that we think about an employer's need, first of all, and what ability is required to deliver on that need. And then we match the candidate that has that ability. So we can make accommodations for the disability. Um, but before we do that, we want to make sure they have the ability to deliver on the role. So I think uh, from that perspective, what's the same about that is you wouldn't consider other candidates that didn't have ability or the right abilities for the role. Similarly, uh, don't, don't accept less ability from a person with a disability because they won't be successful in the role. So um, that, that may seem strange, but on one way, I'm telling you, change the way you look at recruiting, but there's some parts of the way that you do recruiting and talent acquisition that need to remain the same that aren't always obvious to employers. Mm -hmm. Huh. Well, I know because you you told a group of us in our, our CEO forum that we that we do monthly um, that that one of the basic steps is just to to treat them like humans, um, which again is so simple. But what do you what do you mean by that? So, uh, well, without even describing which business it was, we you know a manager came to us from an employer where we placed people of all abilities. And they came to us and they said, we're having some performance issues and, and we just don't know how to, how to deal with it. You know, how do we approach this person and talk to them about performance issues? And I'm smiling because you know, the, sometimes the answer is really simple. It's treat them like a human being. Like, don't worry that they have a disability. You don't have to, you don't have to walk on eggshells or you know, dance around a problem, face it head on. So you know, a lot of it's the expect the same things from everyone whether they have a disability or, or not. I think you see your, from your employees, expect the same performance, because uh, again, it's about ability. And then if there's a challenge, then I think you space it head on the way that you would in, in, in addressing it with any other human being. So some of the things like that are really, are, are really easy, but they're not necessarily intuitive, right? So you go back to this idea of, I'm afraid of the unknown. So what was interesting is the, you know, in that scenario, uh, when that employer came to us with that concern and we explained, here's how we'll do it. We had a job coach with them that helped coach the, the, the manager at that employer uh, to get through that performance conversation. Uh, but again, it went, it, it goes just like it normally would with, uh, with a typically, uh, typically able human being. Uh, so it's, you know, it's fun. It's fun to go through those scenarios uh, for us at Northwest center. We've been around since 1965 and, been focused on inclusion since our inception. And I can tell you, we're, we're not there. We're on our own journey. So we're, we, all, we don't have it all figured out ourselves. So that's part of the fun of, for me of going to work, going out into the front lines and visiting with our staff and with our managers, because we run into those scenarios all the time. It's like, well, how do I deal with this? And if you step back, again, if you bring it back to that, just the human level, uh, you can simplify things uh, a great deal by doing that. And, and, and you guys are leading the way. I mean, you're, you're actually doing it. If I remember correctly, about 40% of your workforce is, has a quote unquote disability of some sort. Is that right? That's correct. So 40% have a declared disability. You know, I believe it's higher than that uh, because even at a place like Northwest Center, people aren't necessarily comfortable uh, declaring or, or uh, revealing that they might have a disability. Uh, but yes, it's uh, so in 40%, just for some context, uh, for people that are that are watching and listening, 19% of the population has a disability. So we're running our businesses at twice the inclusion ratio of society itself, and we're winning because of inclusion, not in spite of it, but because of it. And I think that that's a, that's a really telling message. So for you know, even for you employers that are out there worried about talent acquisition, if you can think about again the disability community, 19% of the population, if you figure out a way to tap in. For that community, that's going to put you that much farther ahead of your competition. Hmm. Hmm. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing. I, I don't think I've heard that stat before. So, as as you look forward to the future, what 
what are your dreams, you know, in, in 10, 20 years from now, what will we see? So, so for me, the, again, I kind of drew some circles earlier. You know, I want the world to be different for my daughter. Uh, I want it to be more inclusive. I want her to be included and embraced by, the, by all of the community. She's got a, a, a great community that does, that does do that now, that does embrace her, but I want society to treat uh, people that way um, across, the, across the country, across the globe, actually. It's the, and it's not just for my daughter who has special needs, it's for my grandson, for my son, uh, for his partner, for, for the people around us. I think that we are better so even looking across Northwest Center, I'm extraordinarily proud of the, of the people at Northwest Center. They're the ones that I work for. Uh, and I, I look at their lives. They, they have stress in their lives. They have all the challenges I think that everyone else does, but they have, uh, I wanna believe, a certain amount of joy in their life because they know what they're part of. And so in five to 10 years, what I'd like to see is a society uh, to be uh, realistic, I don't believe that it's going to be a fully inclusive society that embraces everyone. But if in five to 10 years, society could at least be at a pause and thinking about, again, what's in it for me? Why is inclusion so important to all of us? I think that that would be a great place for us to be. Uh, I can I can see it, Gene, and I'm with you. So um, not sure how exactly we can help, but um, I'm I'm on the bus with you. So, um, well, I guess, I guess um, if, if you want to wrap up with a couple things, one, just your thoughts for, you know, this is the culture eats everything podcast, and we haven't really jumped into a ton of into that world, but just maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how do you think about creating a high performing team and a high performing culture within Northwest Center? So for me, one of the, the first um, myths, I guess, that I tried to dispel when I came into the role, uh, I came from the, the business world, the for-profit world, into the nonprofit world, into this role. And I was warned by my peers in the for-profit world, oh, we go into the nonprofit world, it's a very different world. It's uh, this world of, uh, comes from a place of scarcity, you know, a place of poverty. You're not going to have all the resources you need. Um, it's, it's, uh, for, for those of you that are sports people, it's the JV, it's not the varsity. And, you know, for me, I thought, well, uh, as I thought more about it, I, I thought, well, that, that feels to me, um, more like a choice on my part than an acceptance that I have to accept that that's the way it is. Cause I, I don't believe that. So coming to Northwest center, I'll argue what we do, our mission, um, without reading the mission statement, I'll tell you what. Our North is. North is a world where 100% of kids have equitable access to education and where the employment rate for people with disabilities is the same as the employment rate for the general population. Now, for me personally, that's way more important than any corporate goal that I can think of for any company that I've worked for. So, you know, you know creating wealth for shareholders, you know, creating products, you know, achieving market um, dominance, uh, I think pales in comparison. To what Northwest Center is about and the world that we're trying to create. So I'd argue it's more important, not less important. And so if it's more important, why would you accept less? And so there's this commitment to execution excellence across the organization. So this culture shift that started four and a half years ago is well underway. And we're at a place where um, I go out because I work for the thousand people at Northwest Center and I ask them, what do you need? Here is the high bar we're setting. And here are the things we're trying to achieve. That North is a significant journey ahead of us. What do you need? And they're getting better and better at being able to answer that question. What do I need to do the things that, that you're asking or that we're asking of ourselves? So that idea of execution excellence is really important. You know, there isn't for-profit and nonprofit. In my mind, there's either excellent or not. And, and so that's really what we try to drive uh, through our organization. So when you think of culture, that's the culture we've created. And, I think to a person, they can recognize what they're part of, which is also very important. They're, they're there for the why, not the what. Um, and I think with uh, the last thing I'd say with that in our culture uh, is this idea of we do with, with professionalism and with respect, with courtesy, and, and, and to, to a great degree with kindness, uh, because I think you can do that. So it's, I, I've seen it done multiple ways, but I'd argue you can be just as effective 
uh, and, and create that, that excellence uh, in terms of outcome while still being kind. It, it doesn't require you to, 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 to be something other than kind. And I think if I say it that way, people know what I mean. But that's the culture we're really trying to create. Uh, being kind or being courteous doesn't mean having a lower standard of quality. And, and I, I, I see that coming to life in, in a big way at North Coast Center. Yeah, kind is, kind is actually uh, is a good way to help people be accountable, frankly. You know, we, we tend to be, especially here in the Midwest, we tend to be nice, which means we don't really talk about the, the tough stuff. But being kind, you can actually go at the quote unquote tough subjects, but do in a way that's all about getting results, all about serving your community, all about serving your customers, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're doing. So let's wrap with, because um, the time's flying by as always, um, maybe share your, your book recommendation for us. Okay, so I'll, I'm gonna confess right up, I haven't read the book yet. Uh, it's sitting in the kitchen on the counter. My wife is, uh, is reading it now and then I'm, I'm gonna pick it up after her. It's a book by Brene Brown. And it's, uh, I think it's called Being Brave. I might have that wrong, but uh, the reason I bring that up is that uh, I think we all need to understand what being brave uh, really, really means and, 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 and how, to, how to bring that about in ourselves. I think we all have the capacity to be brave, uh, but I think it looks different than maybe uh, predict, particularly traditional white males in, in, in the, the world I grew up in. I think it looks very different than, than, than what I was taught when I was younger. So I would, I would encourage that. I think the um, the other thing I'll confess is that I watched a, 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 a presentation by Brene Brown this past weekend with my wife. It's not the first one that I've watched. Uh, I did see her TED Talk uh, early on about, um, about being vulnerable. I was pretty impressed, but I have to tell you that in the, the middle of this uh, presentation, um, Brene Brown referenced her God moment, and it involved the man in the arena. Uh, so if you want to quote, Go read the man in the arena because that's been hanging on my wall since I was in high school. Uh, so she, she caught me at that. Once I saw a man in the arena, that was there. So that's a long-winded reason why. But uh, pick up the book uh, by Brene Brown and read that, and I think it'll it'll serve you really well. All right. So let me get this straight, Gina. A white male who is a naval flight officer is recommending to read a Brene Brown book. Am I getting that right? You got it right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you, Gene, for joining us today. And, and more importantly, thank you for the, the work you do to see people of all abilities and to uh, include them in the world so that the, that the world can benefit from them. So thank you for you and for your team's work. Well, thank you for having me, Tom. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today and for the mentorship and the friendship. Uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.